There we go. Hello, y'all, and let's get started with chapter 16. So, persuasive speaking strategies. Now, this is going to incorporate some information outside of your textbook that I think you should still know going into a persuasive speech. That being said, what this chapter mainly covers is it talks all about how to actually persuade an audience. Monday, we talked about all the different factors you want to keep in mind, but now what we're getting to is how do I actually convince them? What do I actually include in my speeches that will have the audience commit to a specific course of action they normally would not want to do? We have this idea of persuasion that it's almost like debate, that whoever can present the stronger arguments logically will persuade the audience. But the reality is that people don't usually do what they believe is right, or they won't do what they agree is the most logical because it might be too hard for them because they might not care about it as much. People aren't logical, aren't logical beings. They're complex. They're governed more by their emotions than their thoughts. You have to understand all of that to know that it's not just about providing evidence. It's not just about providing statistics. It's not just about how much you care about the subject, but about how much you can make the audience care about the subject. So in this chapter, we're going to go over the general questions of persuasion that I'll talk about in a little bit. And then we're going to go into what are called the three general methods of persuasion as outlined by the Greek philosopher Aristotle. So. Let's go ahead and let's first cover the main target audience of our speech. What that essentially means is that you can't really expect in a persuasive speech to convince your entire audience, or at least not convince them fully of something. You can't really expect to give a speech to 30 people about why you should go vegan and expect to walk out of that speech with 30 vegans, 30 new vegans. You can't really go into an audience of Republicans and expect to convince them all to switch to Democrat and vice versa. People are a little bit more set in their ways. So you have to understand that if you can't convince the entire audience, you have to identify which section of the audience you most want to convince at the end of your speech. Because take, for example, this class. We're a class of many different ages, ethnicities, backgrounds, cultures, and so on. We're a very diverse group of people. You have to understand in your speech which portion of that diverse audience your speech will best resonate with. So if you're giving us a speech, for example, on why you should stop smoking, your target audience is not the entire group of people listening to you, because odds are the majority of your audience probably doesn't smoke, or at the very least, knows that smoking is bad for you. So your target audience in that instance would be the portion of your audience who might smoke, who might consider smoking, and then trying to convince them to quit. However, you have to keep in mind if your target audience is too small in proportion to your entire audience, if that's an effective topic for your entire speech. So going with, our, going with that original example, if you want to give a speech on why you shouldn't smoke, you need to consider and ask yourself, okay, how many members of my audience really smoke, at least actively enough that I want them to stop? How many of those, and if the number is like one or two people, then is it really worth giving a six to eight minute speech to 30 people just so maybe one person in the audience actually hears the message. So what you can do is you can try reframing your topic. Instead of talking about why you should quit smoking, you can frame the topic into why we should stop smoking in general, how we can get other people to quit smoking, how we can try to mitigate the damaging effects of smoking on everybody, and then your solution isn't so narrowly focused to a small target audience. How you identify that target audience? Go back to chapter three of the textbook, audience analysis, doing a little bit of legwork ahead of time to understand what prior experience your audience has had with this topic before, what they've done before your speech, what their habits, their behaviors, their attitudes are before, and 
where they might come from in terms of culture, in terms of location, in terms of background, all of those play into how you identify who most needs to hear my speech right now. And now that we've talked about the target audience, now we're gonna talk about the three general types of persuasive speech. They can generally be they can generally split up into three categories dictated based on which topic or how you choose to frame that topic is to the audience. Because first, we have persuasive speeches that deal with questions of fact. Now, in a question of fact speech, what you're trying to do is you're trying to convince the audience that something is true or that something is false. You're trying to argue for the actual veracity of the statement. An example of a question of, of fact speech would be to persuade my audience that an earthquake of 9.0 or above will hit California in the next 10 years. That makes it a question of fact because all I'm trying to convince my audience is that this statement is true. Another example of a question of fact would be trying to convince the audience that the earth is not flat. That is a question of fact because I'm trying to convince the audience that that statement is true. The earth is not flat. Questions of fact can then be framed by simply providing the logical evidence for why this claim is supported. So if I just start again, referring back to chapter 15, when we talked about the syllogism, we just present the simple claim that, okay, California is overdue for a major earthquake. That's what I want to argue is true. My evidence is then many geological signs indicate that a major earthquake may happen soon and that experts agree that a major earthquake could help California any day. These two pieces of evidence then prove my claim true. And then we shift to the question of value. Now the question of value is less clear cut because in the question of fact, well, there's true and there's false, right? There's, it's either there, it's real, or it's not. Things are a little bit more cut and dry in this case. However, when we get to the question of value, the question of value is trying to convince the audience that something is right or wrong. Now that is a lot more subjective. That comes to a lot more of individual opinion. So for example, is passing this law immoral? Is doing this thing good for society? All of these are much more subjective questions that can be framed much more in terms of the debate. That means that it's less so in terms of providing clear evidence and more about building a stronger argument in this case. An example of a question of value would be trying to persuade the audience that capital punishment is morally and legally wrong. So what makes it that question of value is the keywords morally and legally wrong. Wrong is opinion, it's value, it's ethics, it's morality, all of those, right? So in that case, I can't really provide you a statistic that demonstrates that capital punishment is actually morally wrong. I can't really provide a clear cut piece of scientific evidence. So how I frame that topic is that I appeal to two different aspects of the audience. In this case, I'm not trying to build, I'm not trying to convince the audience that I'm right. I'm trying to get the audience to see that I'm right by appealing to whatever would resonate stronger with them. So I can appeal to two general aspects. I can say that capital punishment violates the biblical commandment, thou shalt not kill. And I can say that capital punishment violates the constitutional ban on cruel and unusual punishment. By providing these two pieces of evidence, I now appeal to two different codes of morality the audience might have, because the audience has an idea of what is right and what is wrong. All you're trying to do is you're trying to shift them into thinking that capital punishment falls into that wrong category. So if the audience see, uses religion as a way to determine right from wrong, then I appeal to their sense of religion. And I say that according to the popular, the most common religion in the United States, Christianity, capital punishment is morally wrong. If, you, if people use law or the legal system to determine right and wrong, then I say that it's not legal because according to the foundational document of our government, it is capital punishment is not considered moral or it's not considered legal. So in that way, I now get the audience to start thinking that this is wrong. 
And lastly, we want to talk about the question of policy. The question of policy is most important because that's mainly what you're going to be talking about in your speeches. The question of policy is whether we should or should not do something, whether we should not commit to a specific course of action. It's not necessarily arguing that this course of action will be beneficial, will not be beneficial, because that's more a question of fact. And it's going beyond saying that whether a course of action is moral or immoral, whether it's right or wrong, because again, that's value. This is trying to commit to the action itself, about doing rather than believing. So in my example, I would say that I want to persuade my audience that TV advertising aimed at children should be banned. That we should ban all TV ad, that we should ban all advertising based on children's toys and food and cereal and whatever, right? Now the key word there is ban, because a ban is a physical law being passed. I'm advocating for that law being passed. I'm not saying that television audio advertising aimed at children is wrong. I'm not making that argument, or that's not the goal of my argument. And I'm not saying that television advertising is harmful to children. That is, again, a question of fact, right? So what we want to really identify is what is the specific purpose of our speech? What question is it really asking? And then how to frame it in terms of how we convince an audience. So the general strategy here would then just be, again, providing a logical progression to demonstrate why my claim makes sense to the audience. So I can say that children are a vulnerable population, more easily susceptible to advertising, and that children are less able to discern whether a product can compromise their health and safety. Based on these two outcomes or conclusions, therefore, we should support this ban on television advertising. Okay? Relative, kind of similar to the question of fact, but at the same time, when, what makes it different is the purpose. Question of fact doesn't actually tell you what we should do about it. In my example earlier of an earthquake that hit California, I'm not advocating for, for earthquake proofing buildings or for trying to prevent the next earthquake or to prepare for it. I'm just trying to convince you that the earthquake is going to happen. In this case, I'm advocating for a specific solution and trying to convince you why that solution is the correct solution. Sound familiar for your speeches? And now that we've concerned the three types of persuasive speech or the three questions concerning persuasive speeches, now we're going to get into the real meat of the chapter. We're going to get into the three methods of persuasion as outlined by the Greek philosopher Aristotle. I feel like it'd be important to give you a little bit of backstory on the three methods of persuasion, because you've all definitely heard of ethos, pathos, logos, right? Well, it actually is a story that comes all the way back in ancient Athens, some 2,000 to 2,500 years ago, I believe. I might be wrong on that date. No, it was like a, yeah, yeah, no, about 2,000 years ago. And in the city of Athens, they had started doing this new form of government because before it made sense, right? You just had a king and then when he popped off, then his son came in and okay, you don't got to worry about who's next in line, right? Well, Athens was trying a new experiment and rather than having a king, they tried this new form of government called democracy where they would have people, granted wealthy landowning men, not exactly all people, but a select group of people in the city elect their own leaders. That was relatively unheard of. And what was strangest of all was that, well, rather than having the smartest or most capable or just born by divine right, like a king, you would have the city square. And then you would have these speakers, these people who had all these ideas for how the city should be run, they would bring out basically their equivalent of a box They'd bring out their box, they'd stand on top of their box, and they'd shout to the crowds, well, here's what I'd like to do. Here's what I think would be best for Athens. That's why you should elect me to, the, to government. And that was how power was dictated in Athens, based on who was able to draw the largest crowds when they came up to speak in front of their box. And so at the time, there was also this huge new swell in philosophy in trying to understand what really makes people tick. And there were, of course, 
if they're trying to understand how people tick, a lot of people in Athens are trying to understand, okay, how do you actually get elected? What actually makes for a good speaker? What dictates who gets the bigger crowd? How do you actually get elected in this city? And there was one philosopher, he was called Socrates, and he said, well, it's obvious. It's whoever's the best at debating, whoever can present the strongest argument. If you put two people and you have them debate each other, the audience is clearly going to be able to pick out which is a stronger argument and then just side with the person who presented that stronger argument, right? No brainer. So we got to get better at just presenting more logical, more, more consistent, stronger arguments for everyone. But there was one speak, but there was one philosopher called Aristotle who went, well, that's not really the case because people aren't really logical and people aren't really as intelligent as you, Socrates, because the reality is, is that people don't really like to do what makes the most sense to them. They like to do what feels best for them or what would make them happiest or what would be easiest for them. And they don't just listen to the speaker who had the stronger argument because no one listens to you, Socrates, and maybe because it's your bald and old and no one likes you and the government will eventually have you drink poison in five to ten years. Sorry, a little bit of a historical spoiler later. So Socrates, so, sorry, Aristotle. So Aristotle starts coming up with three general ways that you can appeal to an audience to actually get them to want to listen to you, to actually persuade them into doing what you want them to do. I'm going off a little bit of tangent, but I'm wrapping up. And he identified that the key was not the speaker. It didn't matter necessarily how good the speaker was. What mattered was whether the audience could get on board with what the speaker's saying. This is basically the foundation of all public speaking, at least how we understand it. The idea that the audience is key and the goal of persuasive speaking is trying to appeal to the audience in whatever way you can to actually get them on board with what you're talking about. So full disclosure, by the way, Socrates absolutely hated this. He was like, no one would ever buy this. This is complete quackery. No one would ever just listen to a speaker based on how they make them feel. And yet, I ain't teaching about Socrates today. I'm teaching about Aristotle. Granted, Socrates was probably the most famous philosopher of all time, but point notwithstanding. So now that I've gone in my huge historical tangent, now we're actually gonna get into those three general strategies that Aristotle outlined 2000 years ago. I really gotta look up the exact date on that one. Because first is ethos. Now, ethos is what's called the appeal to credibility. So what that means is that when you appeal to ethos, you're trying to get your audience to see you as the most competent person to speak on a particular subject. Because if the audience sees you as confident, as credible, as capable, as competent, then, I might have repeated competent there, then they're going to be much more likely to listen to you. Think of all the news media you've watched lately about, about COVID-19, about the coronavirus. Now, you want the most accurate, up-to-date information you can possibly get regarding, this, regarding the spread of this virus, right? We're in the middle of a global pandemic. So you're much more likely to listen to a doctor, or at least you should be, to listen to a doctor, and you need to know that it's a doctor. So you turn on the news and you see someone speaking and you see they're in a lab coat and you see that they're speaking very fluent, they're speaking without a pause, that they're pronouncing words that I don't even know how to say, like hydrochloroxine or whatever that was called. And you instantly recognize that's a doctor, that's someone who went to medical school, that's someone who knows exactly what they're talking about. Because they know what they're talking about, I should listen to them. They're worth listening to. So you really want to establish that credibility in the audience. Some ways you can do that, of course, as obviously, like when you were writing your informer speeches, and I asked you to establish your speaker credibility. You can mention a couple sources of research so the audience goes, oh, well, this information is coming from a good source. I know it's accurate. And 
this person actually did their research, therefore they must know a lot about what they're about to talk about. But appealing to credibility isn't just trying to sound like the most knowledgeable or the smartest person in the room. Again, I could, I, at the same time, people could very easily ignore someone who is an expert in their field because they might sound boring or dry or that you can't really relate to them. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the audience to like you. How you do that is you can do that through many different strategies, such as first, you can use humor. That's why I'm almost constantly trying to tell a lame joke every now and then, although that's kind of harder to do when it's like a recorded Zoom lecture, but I try to at least. And basically, humor is a great way to establish your credibility because if you can get the audience to laugh, then they'll start to like you. And if they like you, they're much more likely to identify with you. By identifying with the speaker, they can now better relate to what the speaker wants them to do. I'm more likely to do something for someone that I actually like and that I can relate to, in essence. Humor goes a long way towards that. Humor can also be kind of tricky. Granted, humor can be, can be offensive. We could offend particular groups. We don't really know who is exactly listening to our speech. If we're not part of specific groups, we might not know how specific jokes might come across as offensive. So in that case, I can, t I can tell you that there's one person in this audience and in any audience that you can make fun of 100% of the time and never risk offending, ever. And that's yourself. That's called self-deprecating humor. That's where you make fun of yourself a little bit. By making fun of yourself, you get the audience laughing and you get to seem a little bit more approachable because when you're able to make, when you're able to laugh at yourself, when you're able to kind of joke around about what's about your own flaws or your own mistakes, then you sound like, hey, you know what? This person's pretty confident in themselves. This person's not stuck up. This person's willing to acknowledge when they made a mistake. That makes them appear far more relatable to the audience. Another way to enhance ethos is just how you're dressed. Now. This feels very hypocritical of me to say, I'm not exactly in business casual right now, but if we were to have this class in, if we were to have had this class normally in an in-person setting, not online, I would, require, I would have required that you dress professionally for your speeches. Because like I used my example earlier, the doctor, how you're dressed conveys an impression to the audience. If you're dressed professionally, then the audience will immediately see you as more capable as more credible, as someone who came prepared. It's a subconscious effect that works 90% of the time. Because imagine if a celebrity or a public figure came out to give a speech and they were just in a t-shirt and jeans. They don't look particularly bad. There's nothing wrong with the way they're dressed, but they don't look professional. They don't look like someone worth listening to. And another way to enhance ethos is by appearing calm, relaxed, and comfortable. Now, there's a reason I speak with my hands a lot when I'm giving a lecture. I don't usually talk like this. I'm not gonna go meet with a friend and be like, hi, how are you doing today? Well, I'm doing great. I just finished my last class. I'm doing like a TikTok dance there, but that's why I emphasize that you use your hands while speaking, that you move around while speaking, that you change the tone and volume of your voice while speaking, because all of those create an impression in the audience you speak with your hands, then it sounds so much more expressive, so much more dynamic, so much more energetic. And I can relate to someone who's passionate about what they're talking about. I can relate to someone who has energy in how they speak. That's the primary goal when you're appealing to the audience's sense of ethos. And lastly, you all can also be authentic and honest. Now, what that means is you can talk a little bit about yourself and reveal something that you might not necessarily sh be comfortable sharing with a stranger. By doing that, by sharing that with the audience, by sharing an intimate detail of your life, then the audience might be able to relate to you because they're gonna go, hey, that person trusts me, or at least that person is comfortable enough sharing something private about their life with me, and I can relate to that. Or at the very least, I can feel a little bit of a bond there. And then, now that we've established the audience's credibility, we also want to appeal to pathos, the audience's emotion. 
As I said earlier, people are emotional. They're typically governed by how they feel rather than by what they think. I can't stress this enough. You need to make the audience feel something about your topic if you actually want them to do something about it. I would say the number one thing that people leave out in their persuasive speeches is that they don't create an appeal to pathos. An appeal to pathos is just trying to make the audience feel something, trying to make the audience happy, trying to make the audience sad, angry, envious, guilty, ashamed, whatever. Whatever you can do to actually get the audience to go, to feel a little bit down, to feel maybe a little bit hopeful, maybe feel a little bit guilty about what they've done, about how they haven't done anything yet, and so on. That's very difficult to do with just dry facts and evidence. I can't tell you that 72% of something has, will probably, I can't really tell you that something like 72% of forests burned down have only been in the past 20 years. I can't really expect that statistic to make much sense to you. But what I can do is I can tell you that in 20 years, we've already burned down about 70% of the forest worldwide. If we don't do something in the next 20 years after that, we might not have any forests at all. Think of the last time you went to a forest. Think of the last time you went on a hike and ask yourself if you're comfortable knowing that you might be the last generation of people to have had that opportunity, to have been able to go and see a green field. That tries to create an emotion in the audience. That tries to appeal to a sense of fear, to a sense of shame, to a sense of anxiety. By making the audience feel that way, by trying to frame it in a way that actually gets them to create an emotional response, now they can actually get invested in the topic. Now they can get passionate about it. Now they'll want to do something about it. By creating those emotions, you're able to then create a response. And by creating a response, you now can let that spread because if you're passionate about your topic, and if you get someone else passionate about their topic, they'll talk to someone else. And maybe by conveying that passion to that someone else, then the message spreads. And you're talking to 30 people, but maybe they'll talk to 30 people. Maybe they'll talk to 30. And maybe that's how a movement gets started. Some specific ways to enhance pathos? Well, there's all kinds. But you can make the audience afraid. You can use fear strategically. Now, there's a big reason why a lot of the news today is sounds very scary because that's kind of what sells. People actually only really watch the news when it kind of frightens them because if you just turn on the news and you, and you read, oh, everything's good today in the neighborhood, then, well, okay, well, no real reason to stay updated then. People only really stay updated when there's a crisis happening or when they think something bad can happen to them because fear is a great motivator. I only really want to start running when I think that there's something chasing me, right? When I fear for my life or when I fear for the lives of my loved ones. You can try to make the audience afraid. You can try to make the audience afraid if we don't do this, what do you think will happen? Or if we don't do this, this could affect you very soon or this is affecting you very soon. By making the audience afraid, they'll try to do whatever they can to try to alleviate that fear. What you can do is then frame that as your solution. If you're scared right now, then go ahead, sign up for this organization, and let's get let's actually do something about this. You can also make the audience angry. You can get them angry that nothing's being done. You can make them feel a real sense of a real sense of, of rage, of trapped feelings of why do we need to keep living this way? Why is this still a thing? Why is nothing being done about this? I don't even have a specific topic in mind. I'm just kind of getting heated about it in general. By getting the audience heated, then you'll actually get them to do something about it. You'll have them direct that energy, and that's how you actually get stuff done. Keep in mind, though, I say use anger constructively. That means that you don't just get the audience angry but that you actually try to direct that anger to a specific purpose. 
That means that if you feel angry right now, come with me to this protest. Come with me and let's go to this event and voice our concern. You want to provide that clear outlet. You want to specifically tell the audience what to do because if you just make them angry and then just say, we need to do something about it, but aren't actually specific in what we need to do, then that anger might be directed outward in ways you can't expect towards destructive ends. Because if I give a speech trying to fire the audience up and they get extremely mad and that's exactly what I wanted in them. And then I just say, and you have to go do something about it. And then someone in the audience goes and starts a fire by lighting someone's car on fire. Then I'm kind of responsible for that because I created the feeling and I didn't give an outlet towards that feeling. So, Always understand that you have a huge ethical responsibility as a public speaker. We talked about it last week, but you are potentially convincing 30 people to go out and do something. You want to be absolutely sure that they're doing what you want them to do so that it doesn't escalate and spiral outside of your control because that's still on you. And then lastly, you can make yourself vulnerable. Share a personal story about yourself. If this topic has a, if your speech topic has affected you in some way, talk about it. Talk about how it's affected other people. Share personal stories, share specific stories. By doing so, you now get to create empathy in your audience because an audience will very rarely feel bad about an abstract issue. Very rarely will the average person feel bad that a forest somewhere in the world is burning down today because I can't really relate to a tree. I can't really see, I can't really put myself in a tree's position. I can't really think a tree is happy or feels pain or joy or sadness or anything like that. But we relate to other people. If we hear about other people who are sad or other people who have lost everything or other people who have been mistreated and abused, then that makes us feel sad as well. If you share a personal story, now the audience can emotionally connect with you. If you share a sad story about yourself, then the audience can get sad as well. If you get the audience sad, then that means they're actually going to remember what you're talking about. If the speech is actually going to resonate with them. I'll tell you that the only speeches I really remember, I've taught, this is my 15th class of public speech, no, 17th class of public speaking I've taught at this point, the persuasive speech, so I've heard something like maybe two to 3,000 persuasive speeches, I only remember the ones that actually make me feel something, that actually try to make me feel something that don't just give me statistics and evidence, but that really go out of their way to have me directly address my role in a problem and the fact that only I can really do something to solve it. Or that if I don't do something, no one else will. Those are the speeches that stand out to me. So don't neglect that appeal to pathos. Don't neglect trying to get the audience to actually feel something about the topic before you just move on and try to convince them, okay, go do this action step. And lastly, we're going to talk about logos. Probably the most obvious method of, probably the most obvious canon of rhetoric, but basically logos is the logic and evidence. It's appealing to the audience's sense that this is a strong, well thought argument where point A logically leads to point B, logically leads to point C. You enhance the strength of your argument through the classical methods of just using supporting evidence, using statistics, using visual images, using graphs, using charts, using research sources to provide factual data that not only has the audience feel something, but both convinces them that this is a problem and that this would be an effective solution. Other ways, of course, are to avoid logical fallacies. We talked about those on, was that last week? Yeah, we talked about those last Wednesday. Avoiding logical fallacies means that our argument is sound, that everything makes sense, that if you do this, it will solve the problem. 
And another way, of course, is you can provide illustrations that provide a visual frame of reference to what you're talking about. That's why you also want to have, that's why you also need to have a visual aid for your persuasive speech because it's very difficult for the audience to understand a lot of abstract numbers and a lot of abstract sources and a lot of abstract concepts. It's very difficult to understand a number like 6 billion. However, if you can provide that in a helpful graph, it's much easier for my animal brain to really understand that and to get how big the problem really is, right? So, on that note, I think, yep, that about covers it. So, that about covers chapter 16 and that about covers the textbook. Thank you for reading. J. Dan Rothwell's Practically Speaking, second edition. If you rented it, go ahead. If you loved it, go and buy the full copy. I don't know. So, on that note, does anyone have any questions for me before we head out? Any questions on anything I talked about or anything in the course? Okay, cool. Well, on that note, it was a pleasure working with you all. Absolutely loved it, had a blast. I've been loving watching your activities, been loving reading your reading discussions, and already looking forward to both reading your persuasive outlines and listening to your persuasive speeches next week. If you got any questions at all, you all know how to reach me. Feel free to stop at my office hours both tomorrow and Tuesday, Thursday next week. And on that note, I hope you all have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Later, y'all. Thank you.